Is that okay, Zara? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So welcome all to the MFPH Next Generation Seminar Series is a networking event for early career scholars, juniors, motors, epidemiologists working on or interested in mathematical modeling of infectious diseases and other threats to public health. Bienvenue à tous, la série de séminaires MFPH Next Generation est un événement pour les chercheurs en début de carrière, les modélisateurs juniors, les épidémiologistes travaillant ou intéressés par la modélisation mathématique des maladies infectieuses et d'autres menaces pour la santé publique. First of all, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the Feed Institute operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of Hirunwenda, the Seneca, and the Selgas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Premièrement, nous souhaitons reconnaître cette terre sur laquelle l'Institut Feeds opère depuis des milliers d'années. C'est la terre traditionnelle des Hirunwenda, des Sénèques, des Sogas. Aujourd'hui, ce lieu de rencontre abrite encore de nombreux peuples autochtones de toute Turtle Island et nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'opportunité de travailler sur cette terre. So, our guest today is Dr. Murtaza Baki, a researcher associate at the Fields Institute, uh, Institute, a member of the Advanced Disaster Emergency and Rapid, Rapid Response Simulation and the Laboratory of Industrial and Applied Mathematics at York University, where he explores the macroeconomics of the pandemics and the post-COVID-19 environmental risk. He was an assistant professor at uh, KN2C University of Technology and a postdoctoral fellow at Pex University in Hungary. Notre invité aujourd'hui, Dr. Murtaza Baki, chercheur associé au Field Institute, membre de euh, simulation avancée de catastrophes d'urgence et de réponses rapides et du laboratoire de mathématiques industrielles appliquées euh, de l'Université de York, où il explore la macroéconomie des pandémies, des risques euh, d'environnement post-COVID-19. Il a été professeur assistant à l'Université Technologie euh, de Toussy et euh, chercheur postdoctoral à l'Université de Pex en Hongrie. His talk will be today on the cost-benefit analysis of containment policies to control COVID-19. Sa présentation aujourd'hui portera sur l'analyse euh, coût avantage de politique de confinement pour contrôler euh, le COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Doctor, for accepting our uh, invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Idris, uh, for introduction, and hello to everyone, and thanks for attending this lecture. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and this is a, a, my pleasure to have this opportunity to present the result of our joint re research by Professor Ali Askari at Jian Hong Wu. Uh, the topic of the, this research is cost-benefit analysis of containment policies to control COVID-19. Uh, the main idea uh, that uh, in fact uh, developed this research was that how can we measure the cost of the, or the economic cost of pandemic and uh, in that way, we we got into this track to compare the cost and benefits of the containment policies that uh, are conducted to control the disease. <clears throat> As you know, at the beginning of the the pandemic, which there was no uh, effective treatment and there was no vaccine, uh, the only measure or the only approach to control the disease was the non-pharmaceutical intervention or the containment policies, such as a school and non-essential business activity closure, physical distancing, social distancing, and also the contract uh, contact tracing, uh, which was applied to control the disease. Uh, investigation shows that these measures have been effective to control the disease and the, the outbreak. But the question is that 
uh, beside of these benefits that uh, are uh, measured in terms of reduction in the number of infections, uh, what are the costs of the these policies and how can we measure the cost and how can we compare the cost of the the policies? So the main question was, do these uh, benefits outweigh the economic costs or not? Uh, because of that, we developed this research to compare, uh, in fact, the costs and benefits and analyze uh, and use the co uh, cost benefit analyze of uh, containment policies. So, uh, <clears throat> as you know, that the economic costs are beyond of the direct costs like administration costs or something like this because when there is uh, any restriction on economic activities in terms of social distancing on or restriction on economic activities, we will uh, have the reduction in the level of economic activities or decreasing the production, which in terms of economics is uh, measured in terms of reduction in GDP or gross domestic product. Uh, and so uh, the main uh, or the main indirect costs of the <clears throat> containment policies could be measured in terms of decreasing the level of economic activities. Uh, here we have a perspective on the costs and benef benefits of the containment policies. In terms of costs, we have uh, two uh, main categories, direct and indirect costs. Uh, which direct costs include total administrative cost of uh, policy conduct. Uh, but uh, indirect costs, as I mentioned, uh, includes the uh, value of the deviation, uh, the value of uh, level of economic activities, deviation from uh, the, 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 the trend that if there is no policy, oh, we can say that we can measure the cost of policies in terms of the difference between the level of economic activities when there is policy and when there is no policy. So we know the policies will reduce the number of contacts and it will reduce the level of economic activities. So this deviation can be measured in terms of indirect cost of policies. So. Uh, and because it uh, happens over time, we should calculate the net present value. So we need a dynamic model to measure the economic cost. And as you know, the benefits of uh, uh, this uh, policy, these policies could be also categorized into main branches. Uh, first is direct benefits, which uh, can be expressed in terms of reduction in the cost of hospitalization and also the cost uh, of the, the value uh, of the statistical life when there is a policy or the policy is conducted and we have the reduction in the number of dead. So uh, the reduction of number of dead multiplied the value of the statistical life could be measured as a direct benefit of the policy conducts. And indirect benefit could be as well measured in terms of economic terms when there is reduction in the number of uh, death. It means that we have more economic resources. Uh, if there was no policy conducted, so the number of infection and death uh, would be much higher than when we have the policies. So uh, it means that uh, when we have policy, uh, because of decreasing the number of deaths, we have more economic resources in terms of human capital. So also the potential economic growth that can be happened when their uh, policy is conducted and result in the decreasing number of debt uh, could be measured as benefit of the policy conduct. So, and we will express and we will formulate these costs and benefits in terms of the government uh, budget uh, and integrate it into the DSG model that I will explain in next uh, steps. 
So the goal of this research is to analyze the costs and benefits. So to uh, analyze the costs and benefits, to evaluate these costs and benefits, we integrated, uh, uh, in, in fact, a disease model, which is a stratified uh, age and setting a stratified disease model into a DSG model. Uh, DSG model uh, stands for Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Model, which uh, is a tradition economic modeling. Uh, these models roots in real business cycles models originally developed to uh, evaluate the impact of the technical progress on the macroeconomic variables. So the DSG models are a new version of the uh, real business cycle models in the Keynesian tradition. Uh, although these models are originally single agent models and aggregated models, but could be disaggregated as we did uh, in this research. Uh, so these model are applied to evaluate monetary, fiscal, trade policies and different policies. Here we applied these models to evaluate the containment policies. So uh, in terms of the containment policy, first we integrate containment policies into SEIR model, the disease model, and uh, we model the shocks in the containment policies and bring them into the DSG model. So our uh, methodology is a two level approach to cost benefit analysis of the uh, containment policies. So our contribution uh, in the literature is uh, in terms of SER model is that uh, uh, are twofold. Uh, first is that we integrated the social context into the model. Uh, although this approach has been applied by different researchers, but we integrated uh, social contacts in different settings into the models. Uh, and we assume that the infection can be, uh, can, uh, can, uh, the, inf the people are infected in, in different settings. So we, and then, we applied, uh, um, uh, in fact, a mechanism to update the social contacts in response of the containment policies. Most of the researches previously have been done uh, focused on the behavior of contacts, regardless of the policies by the government, uh, or they uh, just technically assumed some assumption about the trend of the social contact. But here we integrated the containment policies as a main factor that affects the social contacts and then consequently affect the number of infection in different settings. Uh, and also uh, we incorporated the containment policy shocks into DSG models uh, at different stages, the consumption, labor supply, and production. Most of researchers in this tradition worked on the just the uh, pandemic shocks on the consumption as a panic and how the panic can affect the consumption behavior of the people. But here we focus on the shocks uh, in the containment policies, we assume that the containment policy has two parts. The, the first part is deterministic. We fit the model we, I will show. And the second part is the classic term. Uh, we assume that the shock into the consumption, labor supply, and production. So uh, the novelty of model is that we assume three type of the shocks in the SG models in terms of the containment policies. So here, as a tradition in SER model, we assume that the population can be divided into susceptible, exposed, infectious with symptom and recovered people. And also we assume that the, the number of infections depends on the contacts or social contacts that will, uh, that will change over time in response to the containment policies. And uh, so our model uh, could be represented as this, as you see here, the change in the number of susceptible over time depends on three 
fact or, or three terms, in fact, three terms separately, three sigmas that you see here. The, the first part shows uh, that uh, the change in the number of susceptible, when the, the individuals uh, are in contact with infected people at the consumption or when they consume goods and services at home. Uh, let me explain the, the parameters and the variables here to be more clarified. The theta is the rate of transmission of the virus and CIJTH is the contact, the num average number of contacts that the people or each individual at each uh, age group has with different age group at home. CSIT is the consumption by susceptible people, and SIT is the number of susceptible. CJIT is the consumption by infected uh, people or infected ob objects, and IJT is the number of the infected people. So our novelty and our contribution to the literature is to integrate economic variables into SER model here. The consumption by different uh, compartments in the model, the consumption by susceptible and consumption by in, uh, infected people. Uh, so we integrated that. So the first term shows that the pro, uh, how the the number of susceptible, uh, susceptible people uh, is changing by the consumption when they are in contact with infected people, okay? The second part of the first equation shows that how the people are infected at the workplace. Theta as the, the previous one means the transmission rate of the virus, but CIJWT is the number of the contacts that each uh, individual at each, uh, age group has with uh, the people at workplace. So it is called, it could be called the number of contact at workplace or workplace number of contacts. And L is the labor supply. LIS is the labor supply of susceptible people. And L uh, IJT is the number of the labor supply by infected or the supply of the laborers that comes from the infected or infected people that are working at workplace. So it means that how the working people, the infected working people at workplace can, uh, can affect the susceptible working people at the workplace. The last part shows the, uh, the, the change in the number of susceptible in the community. So, uh, theta is the same as before, and CIJC is the number of the contacts at the community. Here we could consider the number of contacts at a school, but because the school were closed totally after the after a time uh, that the policy is conducted, we we in fact dropped from the first equation, but it could be uh, uh, extended to, to include as well the contact number at the school level. And also uh, we can have the change in the number of susceptible at the school. So the second equation is the standard form, uh, except that the sigma i shows the rate of transformation from the exposed to infected with symptom. And the third equation here is the change in infected with symptom. And the last one is recovery. So our model is an extension of a standard SEIR model, including the number of contacts in different settings and integrating the economic variables into the SEIR model. So here I explain the parameters of the model that I talk about them. I, I think that there is no need to talk about. If there is any question, I can explain. As you see, CST is the consumption by susceptible CIT. These are economic variable and L as well, LS and LI are the economic variables that integrated in the model. So according to our model, 
we have uh, a rate of infection, a rate or the probability of infection, uh, which is derived from the model. Uh, uh, here, as you see, the probability depends on the probability of infection at different settings, uh, at home, workplace, and community. So rho IT is the probability distribution of infection over time, uh, which is uh, which depends on the probability of infection in different settings. Uh, as I mentioned, our another contribution to the literature was to model the change in the uh, contact numbers over time for different settings uh, uh, in a, a number of contact at home, number of contact at workplace and community in response to the uh, containment policies. So here we assume that the contact numbers change over time in response to the ZT, which stands for containment policy. So ZT, which as an index, I will talk more in uh, next steps, uh, shows the containment policies. So the number of contacts depends on the initial or pre-pandemic number of contacts and uh, the level of the containment policies. And here we assume a piecewise function form for the ZT or ZT uh, uh, as a containment policy. We assume that before the conduct, uh, uh, we have the level of the uh, containment policies have been Z0 and uh, the Z changes over time if the, con the policy is conducted. And here we integrated a stochastic term epsilon to show how this, uh, in fact, the policy measure is uh, a stochastic. So we assume that epsilon is normally distributed here, but it can be relaxed uh, regarding empirical uh, uh, empirical studies when we model the, the, the behavior of the containment policy over time. So as I mentioned, Z0 uh, is the <laughs> public health policy or containment policy prior to March 14, uh, which we have a mass closure of the schools. And the Z bar is the maximum level of intervention by the government which in terms of the index that we use in this research to calibrate the model, uh, it could be maximum 100 and could be normalized into one. And as I mentioned, the epsilon is the stochastic term or exogenous shock into the behavior because you know that the containment policy is, is a random variable or a stochastic variable. So it, it, it could be the, this aggregated into deterministic and stochastic term. So as I mentioned that I, our model is a two level model. Uh, we integrated SEI model into DSG model, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of pandemic. So in the DSG tradition, we assume that uh, our compartments can be uh, stratified into N groups, N age groups as our SEI model. So in each age group, there is a representative individual which maximizes life cycle utility function as follow. So here is a standard uh, uh, utility function. It, should, it, it, uh, it in fact represents the expected value of the future utility comes from the consumption. So CTJ is the consumption. So the consumption brings utility to individuals. On the other side, work or labor supply, LT, uh, D, it brings this utility. So it's integrated into model negatively, as you see. So here, the beta is the discount factor for different uh, uh, fact for different compartments, 
And we assumed also that there is the consumption shock. What is the consumption? It is, in fact, the, the, the containment policy shock to the consumption. So here, Zeta CT is the containment policy shock on the consumption. When there is a stochastic shock in the containment policy, it affects the consumption behavior of the individuals at different age groups and in different uh, compartments, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And also there is Zeta L as a containment policy shock on the labor supply. As I mentioned, the change in the policy affects the labor supply. So here we integrated this shock into the labor supply part of the utility function. And mu L is uh, this uh, utility of the work. This is a standard, uh, in fact, uh, parameter in a standard uh, DSG models. Here also we assume phi F for different uh, uh, compartment, uh, we assume that the, in fact, infected people are less productive. VF shows the productivity of labor. So we assume that the recovered and susceptible people are more productive than infected people. Okay, so this is also a, a stratified model uh, uh, because we assume the different age groups and different compartments with different behavior. This life cycle utility function will be optimized or maximized with respect to this constraint, the individual budget constraint. The left-hand side of budget constraint shows the expenditure side. Uh, so here we have the P, C is the price of commodities. C is the consumption of different commodities for different compartment of the mo uh, our model. And P, I is the investment price. And I, F is the investment by each compartment. So the left-hand side is the expenditure side of the budget constraint. The other side is the income. Uh, another contribution to the literature is that we integrated the value of the contact, average value of contact into the budget constraint. As you see here, the first part of sec the right-hand side of the budget constraint shows the labor income. In DSU models tradition, usually it's assumed that we have competitive market and we have the wage, uh, average wage, but here we assume that we have a supply of labor for each compartment, depending on the productivity of labor and also the income that each person receives depends on the number of contact that that person or individual has with other people at workplace and average value of contacts reach is the average uh, average value of uh, per hour wage. So we reformulated the income uh, by the uh, individuals in terms of number of contacts. So the number of contacts not only integrated into SEIR model, but also in the DSG side of the model, we have the number of contacts. And the second part uh, shows the capital income and gamma T is the transfer by the government to the individuals. This, uh, the third equation here is the, or second constraint shows the capital motion, shows that the capital accumulation depends on the initial level of the capital stock and new investment. At the supply side of the economy, we have firms in, trad in DSG tradition, usually we have two level production function. Uh, we have the final good or final service production function and a value added production function. But here we just consider the simplified model, in fact, in and consider the, the production function of the final <laughs> goods and services. 
Here also, we contributed to the literature. This production function is a well-behaved production function is called Cobb Douglas production or Cobb Douglas technology. Usually this uh, type of production function is uh, applied to the SEA model. Sometimes the researchers use the constant elasticity of substitution, uh, but the Cobb Douglas is the constant elasticity with the elasticity of one. Here we have the capital and labor. It means that the production depends on the capital and labor. K stands for capital. Alpha is the share of the capital in production or the elasticity of production with respect to capital. And one minus alpha is the elasticity of production function with respect to labor supply. AT stands for techn technological or technical progress or technological shock. Uh, or productivity shock, which uh, is traditionally assumed in DSG model and RBC models to, to trace the effect or impact of technical progress on economic growth. Here we integrated zeta y to our model, to the production function, to formulate and to follow the impact of containment policy shocks on the production. It is, uh, in fact, an extra to the shocks to the labor supply because the containment policies in terms of restriction on production procedures, any restriction uh, that can be <laughs> interpreted as the supply change disturbance because of the shocks in the uh, containment policies will be represented in this term, or Zeta shows those shocks on production procedure because of the containment policy. Another term uh, that is, uh, uh, is a novelty of this research to express the budget uh, constrained by the government based on the cost and benefits of the pandemic and containment policy. As I explained, we have direct and indirect cost of the containment policies. And on the other side, we have the benefits. Here, the first part of the this constraint shows the hospitalization cost. As I mentioned, rho ti is the probability of infection uh, for each age group, uh, which derive from SCIR model, our extended SCIR model. Theta H is the probability of hospitalization because not all people that are infected uh, treated at hospital, some of them are treated at home. So there is no cost on the government, uh, although that costs an economy in general, but here we just express the government budget. Uh, theta ICU is the number or the probability of the hospital uh, ICU admission. It means that those people who are hospitalized uh, could be uh, admitted at the ICU. And the, this, the, and, uh, the next term is uh, theta D is the parameter of the probability of death. It, it shows us the percentage of the people or the probability of people that are affected and die because of the infection. And NT is the number of the population and HT is the daily cost of hospitalization that's reported by the public health. So the first part shows the cost of hospitalization. The second part shows the cost of the ICO admission, as I explained. Uh, and the third part is the deviation in the economic valuation because the number of contact here is affected uh, by the government policies. So it shows the net uh, deviation. Uh, it, uh, here, uh, the average value of co uh, contact is the same as I explained, and the LT is the number of labor supply. So this is the economic value, economic or indirect value. And the, the right-hand side shows the net value of, uh, value of, in fact, a statistical life of the dead people because the theta D is the number of dead or the probability of death. So this budget constraint, as I explained, shows the costs and benefits. 
Here I explained the parameters of the model. Uh, it's not necessary to review. I think that's uh, you can go through this. As I mentioned, the beta sigma is the inverse elasticity of consumption shows the uh, the the substitution between the goods and zeta c. I explained the containment policy shocks to consumption. Mu l is the scale of labor disutility, as I mentioned. And also the zeta L and Y are the containment policy shocks to labor supply and production. And phi is the inverse of the free labor supply elasticity. As I mentioned, we assume that uh, it's different for different part of the, in fact, uh, uh, of the model or compartment of the model. Uh, the phi for the uh, infected people is less than one and we assume the fee f for the susceptible and recovered people is greater than one. It shows that the susceptible and recovered people are more uh, uh, productive than the infected people. And also the other parameters I explained during the presentation, uh, it's not necessary to explain anymore. Let's go to the concept of containment policies. Uh, to calibrate the model, to simulate the model, uh, we need to quantify the containment policies. We apply the Oxford Government Response Tracker Index uh, to calibrate our model, the, con the containment policy. As you know, the Ox CGRT collects uh, the, uh, the data regarding the acted uh, policies by the government around the world. Uh, uh, OxyGRT includes 21 live indicators and we applied uh, just the first part of these, which include eight indicators, the first eight indicators. And uh, this uh, OxyGRT is add up to uh, 100, 0 to 100, as I explained. And for each major indices, uh, sub indices uh, also could be add up to 100. Uh, so uh, the C1 to C8, as I mentioned, uh, shows the containment and closure policies that we assumed uh, and we considered as the containment policies. The other indices shows the, uh, for example, economic support and also vaccination uh, could be applied for other researchers. But here the goal of research is to compare the costs and benefit of containment policies. So we concentrate and we focus on this uh, part uh, of the indic indicators, C1 to C8. Here, uh, there is a chronological approach to indices in Ontario uh, regarding the policies by the government of Ontario. For example, C1E, which is a school closing, uh, on March 14, uh, 2020, the government of Ontario uh, mandated the closure of the schools and uh, also for the workplace uh, closing, we have C2E, uh, which on March 16, 2020, uh, the libraries, schools, museums, restaurants, and bars, among others, uh, were required to be closed. Uh, and also, here you can follow up the change in indices over time uh, regarding the, the, the announcement by the uh, Ontario government. For example, on March 25th, the Ontario government ordered the mandatory closure of all non-essential workplaces. On April 5th, the government further reduced the number of business classified as essential and extended the closure for uh, 14 days. On May 1st, uh, as certain businesses were being allowed to open. So reopening uh, changed their structure and shows the level of the uh, containment policies has been changed. C3E shows the canceled public events. It happened on the March 16th that the government advised Ontarian to avoid large gathering of over 50 people. 
uh, and immediately on March 17, also the government announced that further of all organized public events of over 50 people are uh, closed. Okay, uh, I think that's, uh, it is, we, we, we have, you can moderate the time and you control the time. Uh, I think that, uh, just let me know how much time do you have? Uh, for now, uh... 10 minutes if you want 10 minutes okay i will go through this so the others i do not uh, these are in the paper mentioned c4e is a restriction on gathering also c5e is the closed public transport and uh, c6e is say at home requirement on uh, march 16 implemented this policy and also c7e restriction on internal movement and c8e international travel that the government restricted uh, uh the 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 non-necessary uh, uh immigration and entry to the canada and the guarantee uh, and opened the and mandated the uh, guarantee for the people who enter the current here is the index containment policy index as i mentioned uh, uh, add up to a hundred the maximum could be a hundred and the minimum is zero uh, this shows the level of the policies over time as you see there is a jump uh in Mar uh, in march and before that the government was just collecting the data monitoring the status of the uh, pandemic and uh, developing the uh, instructions so over time you see the fluctuations in the uh, policies depends on the level of the closures or change in any policy. As I mentioned in our model, we uh, applied and we use this uh, index to calibrate the containment policy shocks on consumption, labor supply and production. So we assume these shocks follow a uh, 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 AR uh, process, AR1 process, which uh, the level of shocks at the, the zeta C, for example, T depends on previous level and is the a plus a stochastic term, which is identically uh, distributed. And, and also the other as well, the zeta L and zeta Y are autoregressive of degree one. And uh, here the epsilon and nu T are also uh, the uh, identically distributed with the mean of zero and uh, and constant standard. Here, uh, to to model the shocks, we fitted first a curve to containment policy, as you see in this graph. The curve is fitted using the MATLAB, and we derived the error term to estimate the coefficients of uh, the autoregressive coefficients of the previous uh, uh, containment policy shocks that I mentioned in previous slide. So uh, here, as you see that uh, the deterministic is a cubic and we derive the, uh, the, the residual and use uh, the residual to calibrate and estimate the role in three different containment policies. Uh, for other uh, pa parameters of the model, here I report uh, the parameters of the model. Here we have the probability of transmission per context. Uh, we assume that is reported in the, the, ta the another table separately. I will talk about and also the contact matrix. Uh, I will go through that. Uh, the transmission rate of exposure to infection as well is derived from the literature. The recovery rate is derived from the literature. The RZ, as I mentioned, we estimated. This is the rate of change in the containment policy we estimated. It means that the change in the level of the containment policy over time. Uh, and also the level of the initial variables uh, are reported in following tables. Uh, we here has the number of the population for different age groups. 
our age groups, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, uh, six age groups, zero to five, six to 13, 14 to 17, 18 to 24, 25, 64, and 65 plus. The data derived from the Canada stat and modified for the public health uh, databases uh, because the classification is different in uh, two sources of the data. And other parameters, as you see here, the data is different. It's uh, derived from the literature for different age group. The rate of transmission of the virus is different. Here, the <clears throat> highest rate belongs to 65 plus people. Uh, that's mainly our elderly people are at the, in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the communities that you know that they are more infected. So SI0 uh, is the number of the uh, <laughs> susceptible people that we assume that is equal to the number of a population and also exposed and uh, infected, initial level of exposed and infected are derived from the literature. Here is the social contact matrix that shows the number of contact each individual on average has at each age group to other people in other age groups. So as you see, uh, the number of contacts changes over age groups and between age groups. Uh, so this matrix is uh, derived from uh, literature uh, uh, researched by John Hung and his groups, uh, as I mentioned in resources here in footnote. And we applied this and we updated this regarding the containment policies. And then we simulated the model to derive. Here I reported the main parameters in DSG model. The beta is the uh, utility discount factor as mentioned. And other parameters are reported. Here AR1 uh, or the uh, in fact, the uh, uh, coefficient in containment policy shocks is derived from the residual, as I explained, that it was a two-step uh, estimation of these parameters. So the first result comes the impact of containment policy. As I explained in our model, uh, we conducted the policy and we simulated the model for the policy, the containment policy. And as you see here, the containment policies has significant impact on the number of infection for different age groups and the mechanism that uh, these policies affected the number of infections uh, vary, uh, varies between age groups. And as you see here, it depends on the number of contacts. So, the most impacted are those who are at the uh, age of the war and they are as, uh, considered as a workforce or labor force. So <coughs> the first uh, diagram or figure shows the impact of containment policies. And as I explained, we derive the shocks, uh, the containment policy shocks on the consumption, labor supply and production. So we simulated the DSG model for these shocks, okay? So uh, in the DSG model traditions, the model is reduced uh, in a reduced form and solved uh, numerically. And then impulse response functions derive to show the impact of any external or exogenous shock on the endogenous variables. So impulse response function shows the behavior of economic variables in response to any external shocks. Here, we simulated for three shocks, the main shocks, the, the containment policy shocks on consumption, on labor supply and production. So our impulse response function shows, as I explained, the response of macroeconomic variables to these shocks. The first diagram shows the, <clears throat> the response of macroeconomic variables to the, the containment policy on the consumption. 
It means that when there is a shock and change, immediate sh uh, change in the containment policy that affects the consumption, how the macroeconomic variables will change in response to that shock. The first and the top on the left side, as you see, shows the uh, Y uh, stands for the output or GDP or gross domestic product, shows the response of GDP to the containment policy shock on the consumption. So it means that how the consumption affected by, affected by what? By the containment policy and how it will affect the economic variables such as the output. As you see at the beginning of the shock, there is a change in the, in the consumption and it will decrease and over time will uh, uh, adjust itself to, to change over time because at the initial level, when there is a containment policy and the government closed schools, four places, and uh, all economic activities are closed, the consumption is reduced. And the consumption from demand side of economy affects the production or supply side of the economy. As well, when there is a decrease in the consumption as a result of containment policy, so there should be a decrease in the labor supply, as I men mentioned, then there is a decrease in demand side of the economy. The, there should be a decrease in the production. And when there is a decrease in production, there, there, there should be, and there is a decrease in demand for labor. Okay, so here you, you see the change in the labor, but over time, the labor, market adjusts itself. And one of our findings, an interesting finding of our research shows that the mar labor market is the most flexible market that responded immediately to this pandemic and adjusted itself. Uh, te technical change in the technologies to work at home or the technologies that we applied to uh, to operate our meetings shows and also access to international market because of this innovation in the communication technologies shows how the labor market adjusted to the shock after a while okay so here an interesting term uh, an interesting result is c the consumption at the beginning at the first uh, at, uh, at at the beginning of the pandemic, when there is a panic, people uh, just uh, consume more. They they purchase more to reserve for the future because the government announced that we will close everywhere. So you see here there is a jump in consumption. You 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 experience it personally. Maybe you show how uh, you you saw how the people. Uh, just attack the market. <laughs> I mean that attack the market to collect all goods and because they were worried about that. So the consumption immediately increased and decreased after a while because of the restrictions and then over time adjusted itself. The investment behavior is reverse to the consumption. It is natural. Another interesting finding is the interest rate and wages. Interest rates, as you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, the interest rates decreased, but over time, the interest rates started to increase. And it means that the, the Federal Reserve in the United States and also the Bank of Canada had to adjust the interest rate over time in response to the pandemic. And the last one shows the behavior of the wages in response to shocks on consumption. As I mentioned, when there is immediate decrease in the labor, so there should be increase in the price of the labor. But when there is an adjustment in labor supply, immediate adjustment over time, the wages decrease because of access to international markets. It is interesting result for me at least. So here I explain the behavior uh, in words. Uh, I will not go through this wording because I explained the figures. The next figure shows the 
impulse response function to labor supply shocks or the containment policy shocks on labor supply. As you see, the containment policy shocks on the labor supply decrease the production. And it is a huge amount in the first, uh, the early time of the pandemic. The first diagram on the top uh, of the left side, as you see, Y shows the response to the containment policy shocks on the labor supply. And uh, here, as you see, after a while, production starts to adjust, but the level of the output does not reach to the pre-pandemic level after a year even. And it is uh, coincident with the, 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 the data and the experimental data that we have for the economy. And here, the labor supply, as you see at the beginning, uh, the containment policy shock from the labor supply decreases the labor supply. And then immediately labor supply starts to adjust and overshoots even because of the access to international markets and working at home and different technologies that we have. The other figures shows the response of the consumption, investment, uh, interest rate, and wages to containment policy shocks on the labor supply. And here, the last figure shows the <clears throat> also shows the uh, the containment policy shocks on the production. As I mentioned, it means the the restriction on production processes and the disturbances that happen because of containment policies in the production process. This means that any restriction on the production process, uh, any disturbance, uh, supply chain, their disturbances that roots in the containment policies. So it is, uh, as it is shown uh, in the first figure, uh, the result shows that uh, there is a decrease in output when there is a containment policy shock on the production procedure, and also there is the decrease in the labor, and there is a, a jump in the labor supply, as I mentioned, because of the change in the structure of the production. It means that the role of the human capital uh, adjusted immediately in response to the pandemic. And uh, human capital is the most smart uh, factor of production that adjusted itself to the product, uh, to the pandemic. So the other shows the, <clears throat> the consumption response and investment response uh, in to the, the containment policy shocks on the production as well the interest rate and wages. So, uh, here I explain <clears throat> in words the effect or response of different macroeconomic variables to containment policy shocks on the production. And in conclusion, our uh, research shows that the uh, uh, pandemic not only has direct cost, but also indirect, and it could be measured in terms of macroeconomic variables. And the policymaker should consider and should balance between costs and benefits of containment policies when they develop such a policies. And the flexibility of labor market is one of our uh, main findings that mitigated the the negative impact of the pandemic. I mean that if there was no such adjustment in the labor market, the negative impact of containment policies would be much higher than what happened in, uh, in uh, last pandemic. And uh, I think that it is important to consider in future, think about the human capital and labor market and the government should focus on the labor market adjustment and to develop such a models to enhance and empower labor market contribution to minimize the risk of its policies in terms of the uh, reduction in the level of economic activities. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm waiting for your comments and questions.